titled this, What a Gift. And uh, a little groundwork, I'm going to set a little groundwork first, and we're going to talk a little bit about the promise of of Jesus from the very beginning. Uh, This Christmas season is the most important, or his birth during the Christmas season is the most important birth of all history, isn't it? The birth of our Lord Jesus. The day when the divine joins itself to humanity. That birth produced the God-man, the one and the only perfect man. Think about that. Fully God, yet fully man, which he still remains. Throughout eternity, he'll still be that God-man. We really can't wrap our infinite minds around that, can we? It's beyond our, our thinking. But he just didn't make just a cameo appearance in flesh for a time. He took on that humanity for eternity. And one day, he says, when we see him, we'll be like him. We'll have that glorified body because he paid the price for us to do that. We don't know much. It doesn't talk about what happened before that did. But we know that before the foundations of the world, it says that he was enjoying that time with the Father. John 17, 24. And I'll just read this. It says, Father... I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am, that they may behold my glory, which you have given me, because you have loved me before the foundations of the world. He was with God in eternity past. So I want to highlight some key points about what his birth and life means to us as born-again believers. I was going to go one direction with this message that I already thought I was going to go, but the Lord just just seemed to nudge me and go another way. So I I believe I'm being led by Him sharing some of this stuff. So what we know is what was before not possible now is possible, and it's a reality for us. We have such an advantage now that the Old Testament saints did not have. And hopefully we'll through this study, we'll have a better understanding and maybe a potential for maybe things that we have not received or not yet been educated in, and that he would put a yearning, a a stirring of our hearts to receive more of him, right? That's, That's always our goal, more of him, less of us. The confidence in our faith hopefully be strengthened. And, you know, these words in scriptures, we have to really take and meditate on them. You know, it's not, we just don't read it just for reading's sake. But we have to let the Word of God take it in and meditate on that Word. So I'll go to the, the first slide, slide number two, out of Philippians. And it's chapter 2, verses 6 to 8. And it says, Who, though he, Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, meaning he put aside his own advantage by taking the form of a servant, a low position in life, right? Willingly, he veiled his glory. That's kind of what that means. He emptied himself. He veiled his glory and didn't use his Godhead as an advantage. And he was being born in the likeness of men, verse 8, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. The rest of the verse says, though it's not up there, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, those in heaven and those on earth, those that are under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to the Father. Amen. We're either going to bow on this side or they're going to bow on the other side, right? I'm glad I bowed on this side. Amen. All in the end are going to bow and confess that He is the Lord. You know, it's important. God says that's the name above every name. It's important we use that name, isn't it? I've seen demons flee in that name. I've seen healings in that name. No, no other name under heaven which man could be saved except for the name of Jesus. There's power in that name. He is above out any other outside source that, that would attempt to shipwreck us, isn't he? He's Lord of all. 
So we're going to talk a little bit about the importance of his birth. And that's the next slide, Mark 10, verse 45. It says, For even the Son of Man came not to serve, but to serve and give his life as ransom for enemies, for many. Remember that word, ransom. The biblical meaning of ransom, ransom means a rescue from punishment for sin. A release from all condemnation. Something the Old Testament sacrifices couldn't do. It covered the sin, but the blood of Jesus takes away and cleanses sin, doesn't it? Even our conscience. A miracle in itself. There is power in the blood of Jesus. I love that old hymn. There is power in the blood of the Lamb. Yes. And the other one, uh, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is that flow that washes white as snow. No other name I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, amen. Love that song. Amen. Yeah. Yeah, we do. Let's do that one. You know, how many, how many issues would disappear using that name? Amen? You know, we, we, we get so burdened by life and, and sin and things that hold us down. But the power and the blood of Jesus can break that off. Amen? Amen. So, I'm just going to read this next part out of 1 Peter, uh, for verses 18 to 20. I'm just going to read it. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish, without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world was, and he is manifest in this last time for us. Amen. That's his birth. He was manifest in the last time for us saints. You know, I, I think of, of Barabbas. This is came to me when I was putting this together. What a picture of us, Barabbas. Here's a guy that he was, they call him an insurrectionist. History says he was an insurrectionist. He was a troublemaker, a, a, a thief, probably a, a murderer. And uh, he had, rightfully, he was going to be punished. He was going to be crucified. You know, and it's such a great visual picture, you know. You think about that, that, that Christ took his place, right? A man who should have gone to the cross should have been tried for his sins in his place to Jesus. The one without spot, wrinkle, pure as wool, he stepped up and took his place. That's a picture of us, isn't it? And then we deserve hell. We deserve death. You know, we're all sinners. We're all saved by grace. And he took our place. You know, Jesus was a man of action in the words, wasn't he? Amen. You know, not not a perfect perfect analogy, but I, another thought that was that came to me is, is Jesus stepping out of eternity to become a man. I, I, I think all we could think of is like we would have to leave all our creature comforts of home and go out and minister to the Skid Row area, right? You think that and live among them and preach love and the gospel to them. You know, in, in a sense, that's kind of what Christ did, amen? Stepped out of, out of eternity, uh, communion with the Father, took on the form of a servant, and went out and preached among his creation. And I think about that. What You know, that's probably the best analogy I could come up with. Would all the Skid Row people listen to him? No. But neither did all the people that listened to Jesus when he was here. But some did, and some were saved. Amen? Amen. You know, when, when I was in my 30s, I had worked for a company called Pier 1 Imports. And I don't know if you remember that, that place. Yeah. And I worked at the warehouse. And if I remember right, the it was about a 250000 or 300 thousand square foot warehouse. It was a good size warehouse. A lot of inventory from the floor to the ceiling. Everywhere you could look there was inventory. And I was one of three assistant managers. But the 
the boss that I had, I really admired him. I admired that guy and, and tried to emulate him. You know, we had we had to wear shirts and ties because we were in the management position. So we, we were always dressed pretty well. But we would walk that warehouse daily and, uh, you know, taking note of what was going on and keeping, keeping uh, track of everything. And we never used uh, electric cars, or rarely we did. If we had to get to one site, the other, maybe we did, but rarely we, uh, we did that. We usually walked. And my boss, I saw this guy many, many times. If, if I, I saw him when trucks were being loaded, they were shorthanded, uh, this guy would get in, dig in, and, and help. You know, take his tie off, roll his sleeves up, get up there and help. He wanted to teach us something, he'd do the same thing. And I thought, man, you know, I, I really respect this guy. And uh, when he trained me, uh, and I could see why he did it for a couple of reasons, but he trained me. He had me start from the bottom and work all my way through through every department to know exactly what was going on. And I got to know exactly what was going on with the employees, right? What they felt, what they dealt with. And, uh, I, you know, you experienced that firsthand. And, you know, our, our Savior did that, but even in a greater way, didn't he? Our Savior did that. Uh, and uh, what, what greater example? Um, you know, the Hebrews calls him, Hebrews 2 10 calls him, he's the captain, captain, of, captain of our salvation, right? What that means, he's the leader, he's the commander, he's the one that's gone before us to blaze that trail. And it comes from the Greek word archegos, meaning one who blazes the trail that others could follow. You know, and how many know that you can really sympathize with someone that's going through something if you've already gone through it yourself, right? You can really sympathize with it, and I think that person can really feel it. And, uh, you know, it's part of our testimony for the most of us that we see somebody that's gone through, that we've gone through. We, we love to share our testimony to help strengthen them and get them through. So, anyway, uh, we're going to go to uh, the next slide, Hebrews, uh, slide 4. And it's going to be Hebrews chapter 4, uh, 14 to 16. And it's titled Jesus the great high priest, and it's all because of that birth in Bethlehem. 14 says, Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but who in every respect has been tempted as we are yet without sin. Let us then, with confidence, draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace in the time of need. The high priest, the perfect priest, unlike the previous priest, who had to continue to offer up, offer up sacrifices, our priest offered once and for all the perfect sacrifice. He was the pure the holy, unblemished sacrifice that paid the debt for sin once and for all. That's why he said on the cross, it is finished. No other payment due. Paid in full. The last verse tells us that Jesus holds his priesthood permanently, even now, sympathizing with us believers through our temptations and our weaknesses and aiding us in our need. Right? We forget that sometimes. He's there in the throne room of grace right now, waiting for us. He said, come boldly. Come with confidence. Ask. And I'm there for you. I, I can be touched with the feeling of your infirmity. I've blazed the trail. I've been where you've been. I've felt what you felt. And I can sympathize with you. He's felt and experienced what we feel. With that knowledge, he invites us to come in assurance. He says he's there for us. He's in 100% in charge. Uh, not on the screen, but 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man. But God, who is faithful, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with that temptation, 
will also make a way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Everything he provides. No true believer ever has to fall from grace and mercy. The place he holds as intercessor provides all sufficient power against carnality, evil, and spiritual forces of wickedness. Who provides it? He provides it. He is the author, the finisher, the perfecter of our faith. God's divine power has given us all things pertaining to life and godliness, and we can walk in power and fruitfulness because of that provision. You know, sometimes as, as carnal as we are, we sometimes wonder if God sees and He cares about what we're going through and the situations that we face. And He does. I can tell you He does. And we look at that the price that He paid for us, right? And He tells us that. He paid that ransom. That redeem means paying that ransom. It's, it's, he's experienced that pain, that sorrow, that disappointment, and He can relate. I We have... When I was in the prison ministry, we had a young lady that joined us one time, and uh, she had a kind of a cool analogy using a soda can about redemption. And she said, you know, the, the you take your old cans to the recycle center, right? Dirty old germ-ridden cans to the recycle center. There's a price that's paid for it. Well, that it, it's valuable to the recycler. He takes it, he crushes it, puts it in the fire, burns it down, reshapes it, remolds it to put in that fresh fluid, right? That fresh, refreshing fluid that uh, the, the manufacturer has made. And isn't that kind of like that? God shapes and molds us to, to hold His presence. Amen? He takes that old sin nature and he re- He's already redeemed it. He takes that old sin nature, reshapes it, remolds it, and pours that new life into us. Amen? Kind of a neat analogy. Because of that birth, his birth, we are, as born-again believers, we can now become the sons and daughters of God. We are partakers of that divine nature. That's something to think about, isn't it? That we are partakers of his divine nature. The nature of God now resides in us. Romans 8.14, not up there, it says, For many as that are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons and daughters of God. Amen? Amen. Go to the next slide, slide 5. And we're going to look at a couple of verses where it talks about the new nature that's given to us. All because of his, his birth, right? This would have never taken place without Christmas Day taking place. Second Peter, Peter chapter 1, verse 4. It says, By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. Think about this. We partake of the very nature of God. Our sharing of that nature, in essence, describes the new birth by which we receive the life of God. We think different now, right? We act different now, or at least we should. Our worldview is definitely different because it's not set on temporal things, but we're looking at heavenly things. We're not looking at an earthly kingdom anymore. We're looking at a a heavenly kingdom that we are going to be a part of. So our worldview is different. The Bible says we are strangers and pilgrims in this world, right? I heard a pastor say, you know, the world's looking for aliens. He goes, we're it. Amen. Where the aliens are looking for. Like Abraham, he says that he's looking for a city whose builder and maker is God himself. Nothing in this world should hinder us from ever reaching that goal, right? Can we do that ourselves? No. God doesn't expect us to do it ourselves. Everything he's provided through that sacrifice, right? All because of Christmas Day. Not possible if it wasn't for his birth. So next slide, we go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to look at verse 17 to 21. We're talking again about the new nature that, that is in us now. Therefore, if anyone is in, is in Christ, he is a new creation, right? We're all in Christ today. We are new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. 
All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled, remember that word, reconciled, that, that we have now have peace and fellowship with Him. A relationship that was not possible before, right? He made possible to have us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Continue on to the next slide, 7, continuing in the same chapter. Verse 9, it says, That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to Himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation, meaning we share that with others. Therefore, <clears throat> why is it therefore? That's what we should think about. It's therefore. We are ambassadors for Christ. God making His appeal through us. We're ambassadors for Him. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, He has made Him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in Him we might become the righteousness of God. We not only have a personal relationship with Him, He has appointed us as personal ambassadors. Each one of us here our personal ambassadors. An ambassador is one chosen and sent out to represent a king or a kingdom. In this context, it's both. We will often need to reflect on our lives to make sure we're representing our king well, don't we? You know, that's part of communion a lot. You know, we when we take communion, you know, it can become a religious thing if we're not careful. And, I mean, we should examine our lives all the time. But at communion time, uh, we don't take that lightly. In fact, the Scripture says that if we do take that lightly, He said some of you are sick and, and die prematurely because you're not taking seriously the Lord's Supper, right? It's, it's a time to really examine our lives. Are we worthy to be those ambassadors that Christ has called us to be? You know, we're not perfect, but the God we serve is perfect in us. Amen? And we, we always strive to be where He wants us to be. Pastor said in a few messages back, there's nothing more important than to be walking in the will of God, is there? Nothing else really matters. If we're pleasing God, that's all that matters. It's not about pleasing men. And oftentimes we get caught up even subconsciously doing that. But if it's not pleasing God, the uh, Bible says it's, it's like a clanging cymbal, right? Just a bunch of noise. It doesn't mean anything. Because one day all those works are going to be put into the fire and, and, and set to the fire. And what's pure will remain. All that other stuff is going to be burned up. So it's only in, in the will of God that that is is what matters. So if anybody asks you from now on, if you're employed, you tell them, yes, I'm an ambassador. Yes. Yeah, I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. You're employed. Amen. You know, I... I uh, there was a, a true story of uh, talking about redemption and, and God's ransom for us. <clears throat> There's a true story of a young man, I'm going to call him Johnny, and he was uh, riding a bicycle and he got he fell and got caught actually on the railroad tracks as a train was approaching. True story. This gentleman went down snatched him out of the tracks, and actually saved the guy's life. And so years later, uh, Johnny got into trouble, and he had to go to, to court. And uh, lo and behold, as they bring him up to the front, uh, Johnny recognizes the judge. It was the judge who snatched Johnny out of danger. And so he gets to say to him, hey, judge, do you remember? I remember you. Do you remember the time that you snatched me out the red track? And he looked at him and he goes, yeah, yeah. He says, I do remember you. And he says, well, Johnny, then I was your Savior, but today I'm your judge. Amen? Yeah. So we better take it while we can, right? We want to, we want to be on the Savior side. We don't want to be on the judge side. Amen? Our sins have already been judged if we're born again. So, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, slide 8 says, I have been, or we have been, crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives 
been new. Again, that new nature, right? That's something. See, we read over these things quickly, but it's Christ that now dwells in us, right? Do we make Him look good? Not all the time, do we? <laughs> that's why we got to examine that life. But we, you know, that's an awesome thought. Christ, the Son of the living God, the Creator of everything, now lives and resides in us. We house His presence. We are the temple of that holy God. And the life I live now in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself for me. We need to keep that thought always before us. We have been crucified with Christ now live with Him in His resurrection, victorious life. His strength now dwells in us and is in the center of our thoughts. He is daily transforming us closer to His image. You know, we're, we're not where we want to be, but we're not where we once where we started, right? Can you remember the time when you first started walking with the Lord and what your life is now? I mean, if you're a true born-again believer, it should look a lot different, right? Because we're being transformed to the image of God all the time, aren't we? Yeah. You know, things that, that I played with and dealt with years ago, I don't even look twice at that because God is transforming me. He's given me the eyes to see what He sees, the heart to feel what He feels. You know, I, I did a message a while back about that, that uh, if you see often in the Bible when Christ ministered, it, it was preceded the word, He was moved with compassion, right? When Christ, when they got Christ's attention, like the the woman with the issue of blood, the people that were hungry, He was moved with compassion. And when Christ moved with compassion, things happened. You know, that's for us. If we can get that in our spirit, the closer we get to Christ, the more we're transformed to the image. Lord, we want to feel what you feel. We want to see what you see, right? We want to see beyond the natural into the supernatural to know what you think about it. And we can move in compassion when we see what he sees. We see the lost. We see the hurt. We see the hungry. We can, we can move with compassion. If we move compa- compassion, we will see Christ move. Amen? We'll see him move in our life. We'll see miracles. Amen? And I know that to be a fact. We'll see miracles. Not possible again if none of this, if he had not been born. Thank you for Christmas, right? The Bible tells us that. So we're going to look at a few passages that foretold of his birth. And as I said at the very start of the promise, uh, uh, the first promise was mentioned. We're going to talk about the very first time the promise was mentioned that a Savior was going to be given. Does anybody know where that is in the Bible? The first time that the Bible mentions that there's going to be a Savior. That's a pretty good guess. Genesis. Yeah, Genesis. And I'll share that, right? We're going to look at slide number 9, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And, you know, you have to wonder... uh, if Adam and Eve even understood when the Lord spoke this, if they understood the, uh, if they just understood it. They were intelligent beings, but did they understand it to the degree that we do now? You know, they were the first descendants directly created by God, so we know they were intelligent. But did they understand the effect that their sin had? And did they have a full understanding of what that sin was going to cost throughout the ages? You know, I, I, that just came to me. I wonder if they understood that, if they had a full understanding of that, or how much God uh, allowed or revealed that to them, or if he, if he did even reveal it to them. Interesting thought, isn't it? Did they have any idea that the, the mistake they made, you know, would just continue to go on and cause havoc? But anyway, we'll read uh, verse 15. And this, this verse is after... The sin was committed. He is now, God is now speaking to Satan. This is the first time now you're going to hear that there's going to be a promise of the Savior. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Who's her seed? Jesus, right? He shall bruise or crush your head 
and you shall bruise his heel. Meaning, you're going to hurt him, but he's going to give you a death blow, basically. So the promise of a redeemer, is a redeemer for the first time is right there. And it, it tells about the ultimate victory for the faithful. That passage tells, God, tells of God's spiritual conflict between the seed of the woman, who of course would be Jesus, and the seed of the serpent, who are his followers. And he told Satan, in essence, your plan is going to fail miserably. We don't know, uh, this is another interesting thing, we don't know the form that the serpent took, but some scholars, I was reading up on this, some scholars theorize that, um, you know, there was a relationship there, not, not in a weird way, like there's some other weird teachings on that, but there was some kind of relationship that Eve had with that serpent. We, and again, we don't know what kind of, what kind of form he took, but uh, there's supposedly, at least on Eve's side, there was some kind of effect in there. Because the way it's put, it says that, he said, I'm going to put enmity now between you and her. Where there was an enmity before, right? Now I'm going to put enmity. And what that word means is, is, is hatred and hostility. I'm going to put hatred and hostility between you. In the New Testament, en- enmity is translated to I don't know if I'm saying this right, Ecthera, E-C-H-T-R-A. And remember when Paul wrote in Romans that the mind of the flesh is enmity with God. Same meaning. Two, two opposing forces, right? That they're not going to agree any longer. That there's a hatred there. There's a separation there now. And isn't it interesting that, that states even today, they can't be tamed, can they? They really can't be tamed. And it's it's mostly natural, except for some people, it's mostly natural that there's just a common fear of snakes. Another true story. This lady had a pet boa constrictor that she slept with. And she said it started acting strangely where the snake at night would start stretching itself long ways against the lady. And this had been going on for a couple of days, and she thought there was something wrong with it. So she took it to the vet, and the vet said, not a good thing. He says, why? He says, he's sizing you up for dinner. Because she had told him, well, he hadn't eaten in a couple days, and now he's stretching out. By he said, oh, yeah, he's sizing you up for dinner. You're going to be his next meal. And I think about it. Isn't that the nature of the serpent? Amen? He acts like he's your friend, right? But he wants you for dinner. Yeah, I thought, wow, not much has changed. So anyway, we'll go to First Peter chapter 1, slide 10, and we're going to look at verses 18 to 21. <clears throat> Though the scripture in Genesis mentioned his coming for the first, first time, the plan for Christ's birth was in the mind of God before time and eternity as we know it. Peter tells his readers, verse 18, knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed by the precious blood of Jesus Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was in manifest in this last time for you. Amen. You know, he he knew that man would fall and he already had a plan to redeem man back to what we've lost. What a loving God. Amen. Again, we can't we don't grasp all that and what that means, but but before the foundations of the world, God already had a plan for us. Amen. Why should we ever doubt him? Next slide, Galatians four, and we're gonna look at uh, Chapter 4, verses 4 to 7. That's chapter, yeah, 4 to 7. It says, But when the fullness of time had come, God had sent forth His Son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those who under the law, so that we might receive adoptions as sons. And because you were sons and daughters, God has sent the Spirit of the sons into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so that you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if you're a son, then an heir, 
an heir through God, through Christ. The fullness of time here really means a divine appointment or destiny. Things shift into a strategic season is what it means. His birth at Christmas morning, things strategically shifted into a strategic season, didn't it? You know, and the devil, the devil certainly knew something was up, didn't he? Remember that, that the devil worked through Herod, where Herod went and he killed all the children to and under to stop that king, right, of what it was prophesied, to stop Jesus, basically. And so, but he said he came in the fullness of time. There was a point of the time before the foundation of the world that was appointed in time. And his birth was a strategic time when he was going to make known, manifest his life to us. So we're going to switch gears here for a minute and, and check out some of the Old Testament prophecies fulfilled in the New Testament. You know, we remember a couple weeks ago that we saw that there were, only, there were over 300 prophecies pointing directly to the Messiah in the Bible. And if only eight of those were fulfilled, the odds would have been 100 quadrillion. That would be one followed by the 17 zeros. Remember I went through that and explained how that guy came to that? And so without going through the genealogy of Matthew, uh, Matthew, who follows the family tree, Jesus' family tree, confirming that he is the descendant of Abraham, <clears throat> the son Isaac, recorded in Genesis, and the descendant of Jesse and, K- and King David and Isaiah. You know, and you think about even back then, the miracle of birth of Isaac, it was a miracle, wasn't it? That, that he brought uh, Sarah's womb back from the dead to birth Isaac. Started with miracle after miracle after miracle, bringing us down to where Jesus was born. <clears throat> Isaiah chapter 7, verse 13 to 14, which would be slide 12, says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. This is the Old Testament. We're going to see how it's fulfilled in the New Testament. Therefore, the Lord Himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. That virgin birth was necessary to secure both a real human and a divine nature, as we said in the opening. It mean, means that Jesus did not inherit the curse of depravity or sin that clings cling to Adam's offspring. Jesus was made, was made like us in every way except for that sin nature. In the New Testament, both Matthew and Luke record this event. Luke was a careful historian, they say. He made sure to get plenty of data to fix the dates of the birth of Jesus. He also interviewed, as implied in his writings, many people. Even though we don't have the specifics of all the interviewed, we can assume he talked to many of the, the ones that were living at the time where this stuff was being fulfilled. And of course, we know that both writers, right, were inspired by the Holy Spirit anyway. So that, let look, that's, let's look at what, uh, at what he records. He records the visitation by Gabriel to Mary. And this is where Isaiah is fulfilled. And that's Luke 1, verse 30 through 31. It says, the, Then the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and he shall be called Jesus. In Matthew's Gospel, recording the angel's visits to Joseph in a dream, you remember that story, he said, you will name him Jesus or Joshua, where Jesus is Joshua, meaning the Lord of salvation. But he said, he will also be called and known as Emmanuel, fulfilling Isaiah's prophecy. God is with us, confirming the word. Jesus Christ was made flesh and dwelt among us. Also, again, concerning, confirming Isaiah's prophecy. Then also, Luke chapter one, verse one, verse uh, chapter one, verse thirty-five, slide one. The angel answered and said to her, "The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore, also." that the Holy One who is born will be called the Son of God, the seed prophesied in Genesis, that the woman's seed would eventually destroy the serpent's seed, the union of the divine and the flesh. And then Micah's prophecies about 700 years before his birth, 
he told us exactly where the Savior was going to be born. And that's the next slide, chapter 15, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, uh, slide 15. It says, But you, Bethlehem, Ephraim, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth are of old from everlasting. Right? That's one of the names he has too, is everlasting father. He was being specific. Bethlehem also means the house of bread. And Jesus confirms in, the, in John that he is the bread of life. Amen? Notice, you know, you notice that Jesus' announcements, Jesus' birth, every, all his life, there, it was never filled with pomp, was it? It was always in a, in a form like a servant. He never big announcements or anything. Uh, just very humble. Uh, example for us. John 6. John chapter 6, verse 32 through 35, slide 16 says, Then Jesus said to them, this is where it's fulfilled, Most assuredly I say to you, Moses did not give you bread from heaven. This is Jesus talking. But my Father gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Then they said to him, Lord, give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you haven't seen me and you do not believe. All that my Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will be will by no means cast you out. And basically in that verse he was telling them, don't burn your life out for things on earth, right? In other words, all those things are perishing. All the fulfillment, everything you need is in me. You know, and I, I'm going to end on that note, that uh, everything we need, right, he is the bread of life. Everything we need is in him. In him we move, we breathe, we have our being, right? Everything is in him. And, um, you know, you, he was a great example in a lot of ways. And the thing I'm going to leave you leave you with is is uh, one of the examples he used when he when he uh, fed all the people the loaves and fishes. Uh, he had very little to work with, but he broke the bread and it multiplied and he shared, right? And uh, you know, if we by faith take what God has given us, each and every one of our lives, and we lift it up to Him. He's going to bless it. He's going to multiply it. And He's going to reach people and places we never thought of. Amen? Because we are His ambassadors, aren't we? Each one of us in this room, we've been called and chosen before the foundation of the world to become His ambassador. Amen? Isn't that an exciting thought? That He knew us before the foundation of the world. He, he said He knew He knows the, the number of our hairs on our head, right? I mean, that's how intimate He is with us. Before the foundation of the world, we were chosen to do what we're going to do. Amen? And I'll leave us with that. So anyway, I just want to pray and give you a blessing before we go. Father, just uh, thank You, Lord, today uh, for giving me this Word that I believe You gave me, Lord. And I pray that, uh, that some words in there somewhere touched people's heart and maybe uh, in each of our lives, God, maybe we realize something we've never realized before and that uh, you've ministered to that us today. So, Lord, I ask you to bless these people as they go out, uh, have your hand on them and their families, and uh, we just love you and thank you and, and give you honor for everything you've done, everything you're, you're going to do in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.